Hey ladies, welcome to The Woman Podcast. My name's Katie Beza and I'm your host. And this episode is a continuation of a teaching series that we have started this year in 2021. So our good friends, Rebecca Shatswell and Heather Hoyt, will be leading us through the Gospel of Luke. And this teaching is recorded live at New Life Church in Conway. If you're local and you'd like to join in person, we would love to have you. We meet Thursdays at noon. And we hope this resource helps you as you read along in the book of Luke. And we hope that it encourages you that you can read the word of God and you can get something out of it. So tune in and we hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be back. I loved the snow. Did y'all feel the same way? I love the snow, and yet I was so ready to be able to get out of my house again. Did anyone share that sentiment? It was beautiful, but um, I just want to say for those of you who don't know, Amber is my twin sister. So most of you in here probably know that um, we are definitely fraternal, okay? I'm sure I'm not giving you anything you did not know, but we shared a womb. We've been together for a long time. Uh, so if there is somebody that I know that is a woman of faith, it is Amber. Um, she has prayed over more people than I could even explain to you. She is so confident in the power and the love of Jesus. And so I just want to encourage you to just keep her in your thoughts and in your prayers. If you need prayer, she is a person I recommend. I have watched the power of God move through her praying over many people time and time again. Um, and I remember Heather yesterday, Heather and Amber were at the doctor together getting the report and Heather called me and she was just kind of listing off the report. And, um, it was one of those moments where you just, um, you feel like your breath leaves you for a second because, you know, there were several things to the report that we were not expecting. And I remember feeling on the inside of myself, the place where no one else is like, what am I about to hear? How bad is it? And as Heather kept giving me the details, it was like I didn't even know in my spirit how to respond. And I just heard the voice of the Spirit of God say, there is nothing that's too difficult for me. And so I just want to share that with you because that is what I'm standing on right now, that it's not too difficult for the Lord. Um, but I also wanted to be very real with you guys at the same time, because I know you love us and I know you will stand with us and beside us. And so I just want to be real with what's going on in our family and what we are believing to see the Lord do. And do not doubt if you talk to Amber, you are going to see the joy of the Lord in a way you wouldn't expect because she's so full of faith. She feels like God has given her a word. And so she's already in a, I just feel like a strong place walking through this, but I just wanted to share that with y'all. Okay. Let me pray real fast. Heavenly father, we just thank you that your presence is with us. We thank you that you go before us. We thank you that you see every moment of our lives before we even know what is happening, God. We thank you that nothing catches you off guard. We thank you, Father, that you have already prepared a way for us. You have a word for us in season that will give us the strength to endure and to follow you. So, Lord God, for every hard place represented in this room, I pray that every woman's ears would be open to your voice and your spirit, hearing what you are saying to her in her specific situation, that you would stir her faith in you, to trust you, to know that you are the most trustworthy person in the entire universe, and that you are the safest place to run to with our hard places. So Lord God, we give you every struggle, every um, story, Lord God, is an opportunity for your power to be on display. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I wanted to recap one thing really fast before we jump, jump into Luke chapter five. How many of y'all listened to the really long podcast that Heather and I did together in the snow? Okay, I just want to be a little real about how that happened. So our heater broke, not once, but twice when we were in like the zero degree weather. Y'all remember that, right? So we have an awesome heater guy came out in the snow, like trudging in the snow to fix our heater. By that night, it broke again. So by the next day, we found ourselves living with Heather and Amber and my kids and 
and dog and husband and all of us were in a house together and happy. But with all that going on, we kept trying to figure out how are we going to get the Bible study prepped. And so one night we got the babes to sleep and Heather and I were like, we got to get out of here so we can have some presence of mind. We came to the church when no one else was here. There were like footprints in the snow. I think Lacey had been here snowboarding with her sons, but like no one else seriously was here. And Heather and I are trudging in the snow going into the church. We were here till like midnight. It was really kind of fun. And I was like, we can now say we have trudged through the snow to share the gospel with people. Anyway, it wasn't really that serious, but um, it kind of felt fun, exciting at the same time. But the reason I wanted to reference that is I felt like God showed me something. Of course, I've lost my notes. Hang on. I forgot to put it on. Um, Y'all know that thing? You put it on so it doesn't go away. <laughs> go to display and brightness. Hit auto lock. Hit never. Get back out. There. Okay. So last week we were talking about Jesus's time of testing in the wilderness, if you'll remember that. He had that moment where he fasted. He went into the wilderness. The spirit of God led him there. He didn't eat for 40 days. At the end of that, the enemy began to come to him with one thought after another. That was a deviation from his father's plan over his life. Do y'all remember, remember that? So three temptations, three opportunities to cave to what the enemy was offering him. Three times we saw Jesus stand firm with the word of God in place of the enemy's suggestion. And if you ever need encouragement in how to stand strong in whatever battle you are facing, go to that chapter. Jesus shows us brilliantly how to confront when the enemy shows up in our lives, what to do. And I love it. Jesus does not have a conversation with the enemy. He quotes the word of God over and over. And at the end of that time of testing, Luke 4 verse 13, it says, the enemy left him until an opportune time. In other words, until another moment that the enemy would have an opportunity to take Jesus out. Then the very next story in that chapter, which we also shared about, was where Jesus stands up in the synagogue in Nazareth. And he quotes Isaiah 61, this beautiful passage about his purpose. And he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, right? And at first the people are in awe and wonder, but by the end of the story, they're trying to take Jesus's life. They're so offended by the things that he is saying to them. And I felt like after we shared about the study last week that God brought me back to those two moments. And he said, do you remember when it says the enemy left him until an opportune time? That next story was the opportune time. And I started paying attention to the patterns when the enemy is trying to attack Jesus, what it looks like, because I can make a bet if this is how he attacks the son of God, then this is probably how he also attacks the children of God. Okay. And the first way that he attacks Jesus is he comes to him when he is weak and alone. And when he cannot take him out that way, the very next way that he comes to him is through the criticism, rejection, and hatred of people that should have his back. Jesus' hometown. They should be the ones rooting around Jesus, like gathering around him, cheering him on, and honestly being proud of him that he's about to go out from their town and do ministry unlike they have ever seen. And instead, they are offended by what he shares with them. They reject him and they try to throw him off a cliff. And I felt like God was trying to remind me, the enemy will come to you when you are weak and alone. And if he can't take you out that way, in other words, if you pass that test, standing firm on the word of God, he will start using the rejection and the criticism of people around you to also try to take you out. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. If you feel like you've experienced either one of those moments, you are in great company because Jesus leaves us his example of overcoming so that we know how to overcome. Okay. So now we're going to jump into Luke chapter five. Okay, and I want to give you a, a few ways to think about Luke chapters 5 through 7. You may have just read 5 through 6. I may mention chapter 7. We'll see. Um, but what I love is that purpose over Jesus' life that he stood up in the synagogue and declared. Does somebody have it? It's Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Can you read it just to remind us what the purpose on Jesus' life is? Mm hmm. And 19. 
Okay, exactly. It's a beautiful passage. It's a longer passage in Isaiah 61 if you want to go and read it there. But what I love is what we are about to read in Luke chapters 5, 6, and 7 is a fulfillment of that purpose. You start to see Jesus day in and day out do every one of those things. He starts proclaiming freedom to captives, good news to poor and broken people. He starts declaring sight to people who are blind and setting free all all sorts of people from all sorts of bondages. It's amazing over and over again to watch what Jesus does just in those next few chapters. But as I was reading all three of those chapters, I felt like God began to just show me a way to look at how they all fit together. And it is that Jesus begins to demonstrate through ministry day in and day out that he has full authority over all things. So I don't know if you like to write in your Bible. Okay, confession time. How many of y'all think it's okay to write in your Bible? How many of you feel like bad if you like write in God's word? I used to feel that way in the church I grew up in. I felt like it was like wrong, like I was desecrating it. But I'm like, I get it in me if I can write things in the sidebar. So if you feel that way, I encourage you to write in your Bible and I'm gonna give you a few things to write. Y'all with me? Okay, chapter four, verse 31. It's actually right before chapter five. This is the first miracle on record in Luke. I feel like we see Jesus demonstrate authority over the spiritual realm. So if you're going to write something beside that, write authority over the spiritual realm. And this is where Jesus begins to set people free who have unclean spirits on the inside of them. And then chapter 4, verse 38, he begins healing people and we see his authority over sickness. And obviously... (laughs) I love that sister. And obviously it's only the first time you begin to see Jesus demonstrate this authority. You will see it over and over again. And then chapter five, verse one, the story we're about to go to where he calls Peter, we see him demonstrate his authority over nature. Chapter five, verse 17, we see Jesus demonstrate his authority over sin. Chapter 6, verse 1, we see that he is the authority over the Sabbath. He has authority over the Sabbath. Chapter 7, verse 1, he has authority over all nations. This is where he works his, performs a miracle for the first person outside of the nation of Israel that we see in the book of Luke. Chapter, authority over all nations. And then chapter 7, verse 11, he raises a widow's son to life, and we see that he has authority over death. Within three chapters, this is the authority we see coming from the life of Jesus. Authority over all spirits, authority over sickness, authority over nature, authority over sin, authority over the Sabbath, authority over all nations, and authority over death. So I want us to remind ourselves when we feel discouraged at the weight of whatever it is that we are walking through, there is nothing that is too difficult for him. So can I encourage you, if you are in a dark place, you're discouraged, whatever situation you're in, you're like, there is no hope for this situation. It will not change. I don't see any way out. Just read these three chapters. And your mind is going to be blown, not by the circumstance, but by what Jesus is able to do with any circumstance. Okay? Okay, chapter 5, verse 1. I love this. This is where Peter enters the story. How many of y'all love Peter? Man, he's my guy, right? I identify with him in the scripture. He has some major flaws and they're very easy easy to see. But Jesus never turns from his dedication to what he's doing in Peter's life. So Peter gives me hope, right? If Peter can make it to not only be a disciple, but a strong leader in the church after Jesus' ascension, then there is hope for all of us, okay? So we get introduced to Peter in this very story. But do y'all remember his real, his first name is given name? Simon. So he's going to be Simon because his name hadn't changed yet. That moment hadn't happened. Okay. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret 
And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and they were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little distance from the land. And he sat down and continued teaching the crowds from the boat. Okay, I want you to get this picture in your mind. People began to hear of what Jesus was doing. Remember, this is pre-cell phone days, okay? So my point is, something amazing happens, or not even amazing, really, very subpar around us these days, right? And it still goes viral within seconds, right? I mean, it's like, did you see this dog lick this weird thing? And then we like send it out to thousands of people, and everybody's like, yeah, I saw it. But just imagine, they are living in the days of pre-technology, Okay, And yet what Jesus is doing is so powerful. The word about Jesus is traveling. Like within days and weeks, there are people that are coming from far off lands to have a shot at being in the presence of Jesus. Can you imagine if you heard there's a man who can command evil spirits to come out of people or people that are are struggling with sickness and disease and they're being healed literally in that moment. If you found yourself in one of those places of need, what would you do to get to Jesus? So the word is traveling out about Jesus. So there are crowds gathering and this is, they don't have microphones like I'm talking on today. So can you imagine if a crowd gathered around Jesus, how is he going to communicate to all of them? And I say that because we often picture Jesus as being like this sweet little guy that's, you know, blessed are the poor, that talks like that. But he gets in a boat and scoots out a little bit from the shore and addresses an entire crowd. So I think Jesus was a loud talker. What do y'all think? I mean, his voice is able to amplify, to speak to thousands of people that can hear him, okay? I think he may have, a, you know, just a little more boldness in there than we realize. So anyway, he starts addressing the crowd. It says, verse four, now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon responded, I love Simon, which is Peter, and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. What do we learn about Peter's personality in that first, very first statement? Anybody can say anything. Okay, he has an opinion, right? You hear what Peter thinks like first second. That's the first thing that comes out. Any other thoughts about his personality? He's outgoing, okay. He's receptive. Yeah, I think Peter is definitely a strong personality. I think he's a leader. A strong personality always think they know, right? Y'all know anybody that just always think they know? They're just like, you know, I'm right. If you would just ask me, I'm right about everything. I could help you out. Like what I know, if I, if I tell you something, it's going to be the thing. So Peter can't help himself. What he knows is the very first thing that comes out is out of his mouth to Jesus. The dude that he watched heal his mother-in-law like a couple of days before that. The guy that he's watched heal person after person. He says, move your boat out a little ways and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter just can't help himself. He's like, master, we've been here all night. We haven't caught anything. Right? Because what is Peter's level of knowledge in this area? He's an expert. He's a fisherman by trade. He's done this for years and years. He's a pro. So when Peter says there's nothing to catch, there's nothing to catch. Have you ever felt like you know what you know about your situation in all your years of experience, in all your years of doing what you do or being in the situation that you're in, you know what's going to happen. Peter knows what it's like to fish all night looking for something and there's nothing there. And he knows by the next morning, it's not going to change. So why does Peter decide to take a chance on what Jesus is saying? Did we even get to the rest of what he said? Okay, sorry. Simon responded and said, "We Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Why did he decide to do what Jesus said? Any thoughts? He, he's already seen him do some amazing things. Has anybody noticed what he calls him? He calls him master. What do you think he means by that word? He was listening to him teach. Yes, he has knowledge in his heart that he's different. Think about it. If we called someone master, what would we mean by that? If they have authority over what? 
Right. At least you indefinitely authority over other things. So it's so interesting to me that he says, master. In other words, I recognize your authority, but let me tell you what I know because strong personalities can't help themselves. And then he catches himself while he's doing it because that's what happens with strong personalities, right? I have one. It's like you just start telling everything you know and you're like, but maybe I need to take a step back and rewind a second and like get the Holy Spirit for a minute and then respond again, right? This is the moment Peter is having. He's like, we've tried this all night long and nothing has happened, but I will do as you say. In other words, he recognizes the authority of Jesus is greater than all that he knows. Okay. So he, he, what's amazing to me about the miracle that happens here is often we see Jesus respond to people's faith, but Jesus is not doing this miracle because of Peter's faith. Peter doesn't have faith that this is going to happen. He doesn't do it because he believes he does it because he trusts his leadership. So he chooses to obey his voice anyway. Have you ever found yourself in a place where God has asked you to do something and you don't have any faith that the thing that God asked you is actually going to happen, but can you find in yourself enough trust that maybe if God asked it, maybe he knows something a little more than you and can actually accomplish what is on his heart because of your obedience. Sometimes I think obedience is stronger than faith. I think God is just looking for people that will do what he says, whether your heart's fully in it or not. Are you willing to obey? And I love that about Peter. His faith wasn't there yet, but he was willing to obey the voice of Jesus. So then let's read the next part. It says, when they had done this, uh, when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish and their nets began to tear. Can you imagine? I'm not a fisher woman. But this is when they fished with nets. Can you imagine having a net made to catch fish and you catch so many, the net itself cannot hold the quantity. It is safe to say Peter in his lifetime had never had a catch like this. Think about working hard at something your entire life and all of a sudden having a breakthrough in a proportion you had never expected. So what is a fish in, in real terms? What does that mean to a fisherman? It means money. It's how they make money. So can you imagine just looking at the blessing and looking at the multiplication and the breakthrough that happened? That's not just food on the table. That is money for years to come. This is what Peter is looking at. It says the nets begin to tear. So they signal to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. This is what happens when God blesses you and I for being obedient, even when our faith isn't there yet. That blessing is always big enough to bring other people along as well. It is so big, Peter himself cannot contain it all. He's got to go get other friends that then get to benefit because of what Jesus chose to do in Peter's life. This is what's awesome about our ability to obey God, even when our faith isn't there yet. God's not just going to bless you. He's going to bless those that are around you. So can I encourage you, if you know God has asked you to do something and you are paralyzed by fear right now, would you just dare to take a step in obedience to the Lord and watch what he's going to do? Okay, let's keep going. Um, But when Simon Peter saw this, okay, now if you were asking, you know, if God asked you to do something, you didn't really have faith, much was going to happen, but you obeyed anyway. And then God sent an abundance of blessing in your life, whatever that area would be. Like, let's say you won the lottery tomorrow. A, right? Okay. Whatever that area of blessing would be for you. If you all of a sudden saw more than you ever imagined, what do you think your first response would be? How many of you would have a praise break? Okay, maybe hands in the air, maybe a little dance. Anyone else? Run around the room, what else? Yeah, I mean, I would start... I'll start texting everybody I know, right? You are never going to believe what just happened, right? Okay, let's look at Peter's response. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus's knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish, which they had taken. I love this moment because it is so real. It shows you where Peter started with Jesus. Peter was aware of his own sin. And when he encountered the greatness of a holy God, he immediately thought, I need to be disqualified. In fact, I know what I've done. And if I stay near this holy man, I could taint his ministry 
because of what I've done? Have you ever thought because of something you've done in your life that you're disqualified to be used by God? Or that if he uses you, maybe you'll mess up something in God's plans because when somebody finds out the past that's gone on in your life. We don't know Peter's past, but Peter knows his past. So he's not saying, this is awesome, Jesus. I can't believe you did this. He's like, you've got to get away from me. I can't even be near you or around you. I am sinful. I just want to tell you, when we encounter the direct presence of a holy God, sometimes we become more aware of the weaknesses and imperfections in our life. And that's not a bad thing. Do y'all remember um, the prophet Isaiah back in the Old Testament in his book, Isaiah? I don't remember what chapter it is, but he says, he has this moment and he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And you know, he has this encounter right there where all of a sudden God opens his eyes and he can see God in his throne room and the glory. And he starts describing what God looked like and the angels and the whole picture. It was beautiful. And Isaiah's immediate response was, woe is me. Like, oh no, I am in danger of judgment because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the Lord of glory. Isaiah encounters the holiness of God and he has the same response Peter does. I can't be near this because of all the things that I've done. But what happens in Isaiah's story, if you don't know, I'll just tell you. An angel, I mean, it's a vision. An angel takes a coal from the altar in front of the Lord, puts it to Isaiah's lips and cleanses Isaiah in the very area that Isaiah felt the most weak. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And the angel cleanses his lips. And then Isaiah gets the call to go out and be a prophet of God. I'm saying that to you guys because the area of your greatest sin and weakness, you don't realize, but God wants you to recognize it in his presence, not so you feel shame, but so you call it out to him so he can remove it from you and then anoint you in that very area of weakness. So I'm telling you, if you have a past where you have crossed lines physically and you know what it is like to be in sexual sin, God wants you to confess it in his presence and he is going to replace that sin stronghold with an anointing. You will go out to people who who struggle with your same issue and your testimony to them will help set them free. We have to start seeing our sin differently. Not that it's not sin. We need to recognize it's sin and call it out as such. But recognize when God says what the enemy means for evil in your life, I'm going to turn it around for good. Our biggest mistakes are the areas where God wants to anoint us with his greatest glory. Because when you've fallen in an area over and over again, you know when God sets you free, it has nothing to do with you. And that is what people need to hear. They don't need to hear, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps or I just worked really hard and finally got over this issue. They need to hear, no, I didn't know what I was doing. And I just got honest before God and I I don't know how, but he has been setting me free and this is how I'm walking it out. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't really plan on going there for all that time. Okay. So Simon says, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For amazement has seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And likewise also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, I want us to hear this from the Spirit of God to us. Do not fear. Don't fear because of your sin. Don't be afraid that you've messed up so much that I cannot use you. Don't be afraid because of your sin that I'm going to change my mind about you and pick somebody else as my disciple. Jesus, when he looks at Peter and says, don't fear, he's saying, Peter, I already know. I know everything you've done and I chose you for a reason. So he says, do not fear from now on, you will be what? Fisher of men, my, this version here says catching people. Does y'all say anything else? Catching men? Fishing for people. Okay, why is this language so perfect for Peter? It's the world he understands. He knows what it's like to put in a good night's hard work because that's when a lot of the fishermen would go out at night 
and let down their nets and bring in fish and use that so that God would bless them with provision for their family. He knows the trade of being a fisherman and God is speaking to him. Jesus is speaking to him in a language he understands. In other words, the thing you've been doing your whole life that you thought had nothing to do with God, well, it really does. It's a metaphor for what you're about to do in the kingdom of God. God can use anything we do. It doesn't matter how you're gifted or what area he's called you to or what profession you work in or are you a stay-at-home mom. The Lord is able to anoint that specific area in your life to become a powerhouse for his kingdom. So I would invite you to ask God, how do you want to use what I am doing day in and day out right now to be a powerhouse for your kingdom, Jesus? It's probably not fishing. Any fisherwoman in here? Okay. If it's being a stay-at-home mom, God, how do you want me to use this for your kingdom? Are there other moms I can reach out to in this season? Are there other people that I can encourage towards you? Okay. He says, do not fear from now on, you will be catching people. Sing it. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Okay, did y'all catch that? Did they go and cash in the fish? They left everything and followed him. Why do you think they did it? I mean, you know, they're looking at those, those boats as dollar signs. Why do you think they left it all? They found the source. It was better. He was better than any blessing they could imagine. They knew as long as they were with him, that well was not running dry. So I'm like, man, how many other people got that catch of fish? Because you know there weren't those dudes sitting on the shore like, okay. Um, Okay, we don't have much time. Man, that's just one story. I wanted to go through so many more. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me do one more story. Y'all want to do the paralyzed man going through the roof? We'll do that story. Okay. Verse 17. On one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. This is important to note. This is the first time we see the Pharisees start showing up to see what Jesus is doing. You remember me telling you at the beginning the enemy tried attack number one when Jesus was weak and alone. Attack number two was through the criticism and rejection of those who were close to him. Attack number three is through church leaders. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, through believers who were offended at what he said because it was true and they were jealous of his influence. And the Pharisees can't get over it. You will watch them be really an enemy to Jesus for the rest of his earthly ministry. Okay, side note. Um, But they start coming from everywhere because they start hearing the same news that everyone else is hearing. There's this man, he's healing people. He's teaching things with authority like we've never heard. And they want a front row seat to what Jesus is doing. So I want y'all to have that in your mind. When this moment happens, this healing moment, they are on the front row. Okay, And the Lord's power to heal was in him. Just then some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. How many of you love this story? I mean, we all need friends like that. How many of y'all think that it was four guys? That's what I've always seen in my head. But I don't know if I've just seen that because that's how it's always depicted. But I'm like, he could have been a skinny man and four would have been fine. He could have been a big dude. They might have had to have six, right? Do y'all think it was four or six? Four? Yeah, we don't know, right? Four to six. My point in, in giving you a number is we need to have a small circle of people like that that will do whatever it takes when we're the one in need when we're the one paralyzed from whatever is going on in our life, that will do whatever it takes to get us to Jesus. So I encourage you, if you know somebody you love that is going through a really rough situation, or maybe they're stuck in a situation, have been in that for a long time, find three people to agree with you in prayer for the long haul over that person's life and watch what God will do with it. I remember um, a season years ago when my sister Heather, I'm sure you're following me telling the story. Um, She was away from God and she had a boyfriend that was toxic in every way. I mean, I can identify with that story. I had that in my own life at one point. 
And I just remember me and Amber and my dad and my other sister having a conversation one day. And my dad was just so concerned about what was going to happen in Heather's life. And, you know, she just was off on her own doing her own thing. And it was, seemed like no one could get to her. And I just remember having this faith rise up in me. And I was like, Dad, she's going to come out of this. God is going to set her free from this relationship. She's going to be doing ministry in the future. And he looked at me and he was like, how are you so sure? And I said, I don't know. I just have faith that this is going to happen. And so we started agreeing as a family that every day at what time? 4.30, Amber has a better memory than I do. At 4.30, we would pray for my sister, Heather. And several months later, Heather called me on the phone and she basically said, like, I'm ready to leave my life. I'm ready to leave this guy I'm with. I want to move to Conway. I want to make a total change and transformation. And we begin to have a conversation about what changed her heart. And she goes, I don't know. Something's been messing with me. Like every day at 4.30 for the last three months, when I'm driving home from work, I can't explain it to you, but I just cry all the way home from work. And I don't know what's happening, but I know that God is trying to get my attention. And I all of a sudden realized like, you know, we know the power of agreement in prayer and we believe in the scriptures that talk about it. But I was like, man, the Holy Spirit was able to do what none of us could do. He can get to the heart of a person. He can speak to the depths of them. All we did was agree in prayer and we saw God work a miracle. I just want to say that. Okay. Verse 20, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Okay, how many of you do a double take when you hear what Jesus says? The paralyzed guy comes through the roof, (laughs) through the roof, okay? If Pastor Rick is ever on stage and the roof opens up and a paralyzed man gets dropped on a stretcher, I'm betting Pastor Rick's not going to go, your sins are forgiven, right? (laughs) Not that he's Jesus, but that was my closest analogy, right? Why does Jesus say your, your sins are forgiven? Maybe it's the root of the problem. Why else? He, maybe he's more concerned about his spirit than the physical. She said it's the greater need. I would say to demonstrate the greater healing first. To show them who he was? Exactly. We are going to see that for sure. To show him who he was. Think about it. God can heal our bodies, but if our soul is not healed, that is the greater loss. If we get a healing from the Lord in our physical body, but we don't encounter him in salvation, repent of our sins and his spirit move in on the inside of us, what did the physical healing really matter? Jesus sees the healing that matters the most and he goes to that one first. Friend, your sins are forgiven. And of course, it's so offensive to the Pharisees. So let's read what they say. Then the scribes and the Pharisees begin to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? I love Jesus. He's so good at reading minds. He's always addressing what they're thinking when they don't say anything. The thing that's amazing to me about this is they ask the right question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's the right question. They just came to the wrong conclusion. It says, but perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But so that you may know the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded and giving glory to God and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. I just want to encourage you no matter what God does in your life to never lose the awe of your salvation. You remember, I mean, we'll get to it, maybe not today, I don't know when we'll get to it, but at a moment in the future when God, when Jesus calls his disciples, he will send them out two by two into towns and he gives them his power, the power of his spirit, and they come back rejoicing because they were able to see demons cast out of people at their word. Do you remember that? And Jesus says, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, don't become so over overwhelmed at the power of God moving through you that you think it is greater than the power of your own salvation. I just say that because no matter how 
great we become in ministry, how anointed we become, how many gifts we have and operate in. Whoever is standing at the front with the mic in their hand, we have to remember we are just as in need of Jesus as the person in the crowd with the greatest sin. Because when we stop needing Jesus, we stop knowing him. Jesus says there will come a day that there will be people before him that brag about all the ministry they did in his name. I taught in your name. I cast out demons in your name. We perform miracles in your name. And he will still say, depart from me, for I never knew you. We cannot lose the awe that a great and powerful and holy God made a way for you and I. When we had no ability to take care of our own sin, he made a way, gave his own life to cover us, not because we deserved it, but because of his great love. That is the greatest miracle you and I will ever see in our own lives. Okay, listen on that. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're honored to be in your presence. We're honored to look at your word, to learn the amazing, wonderful things you have placed in these pages. I pray, Jesus, you would speak a word to all of our spirits. Encourage us, Lord God, wherever we are at. In Jesus' name, amen.